Finally, I get to talk about my bike. <laughs> it's the sickest thing on the planet. I'm so excited. Today I get to talk with us about vision and intention and means, the way God has designed you to live your life. You guys all, if you're new with us, you have an outline in your little program thing you got when you came in. You can pull your outline out. Uh, and the rest of you know where the outlines are online and so forth. And then you have a card on your chair. It's a, it says, what's my VIM? What's my VIM? What's my VIM? So we're going to talk about this today. We're going to talk about my bike, my bike, which is amazing. Let's see. I have a picture of it. There it is. That's the picture at uh, Sunset Cliffs. It is, it is so incredible, and it's about my vision. Uh, and so I want to kind of use it throughout this morning to help you with your vision and what God has for you this year in 2019. Now, when it comes to vision, it can be an assorted uh, amount of things. What, like, I want you to be specific and very practical today. Like, like, what is it that God wants to do in your life? Now, it could be in a lot of different ways with regard to 2019. It could be, like for me, my bike is about health. It's about wanting to up my game as it relates to health because I have... A degenerative disc disease in my neck and in my back, my lower back. I don't have any discs left in my neck and in my lower back, and I have a compression fraction of, uh, fracture of L1. And so it's just in, uh, impacted my ability to surf, uh, with, which is my love. Uh, if you know me, those of you who knew, you don't know this, but I've been surfer for, for 42 years. I love surfing. It's the love of my life. But I can't really do it the same anymore. Everybody's been asking me, Pastor Mike, were you out in the big waves this past week? How many of you know the waves were big this past week? They were incredible. They closed OB Pier twice, I think, two days in a row. It was, it was giant. It was breaking outside the pier. But I can't surf the big waves anymore. Uh, I've surfed the biggest waves California's had for 40 years. I just can't do it anymore. It really impacts my body. And, and so my vision, and it, this could be part of your vision. A lot of you have uh, part of your vision every year is to get in better shape. And uh, how many of you are a member of a gym? <laughs> Look at all this. And how many of you have seen more people since January 1st at your gym? <laughs> like, like it's wild, right? But, but that's cool because we're all trying. And that's what this is about. This is about our, our vision and what, we, what God has for us. And so I had this vision about a particular car, particularly cardio because I, I do not like cardiovascular workout. How many of you do not like cardio workout? God bless you. You are my friends. I don't like cardio. I've been able to cheat my whole life because I'm a surfer. So I can surf and I get cardio by virtue of doing it. But when you stop doing it regularly, you lose cardio. You, you just do. All of a sudden, you're more winded doing simple things. It's like stupid. It's crazy. It's like weird. And I realized this. And so I began with this vision. For, for better health, and so I did all this research and so forth, and, and uh, you know, ultimately, and, and I love the ocean, so I needed a bike. I can't ride a normal bike. I cannot take the horizontal impact on my neck and back, uh, so I can't do that. Plus, I don't really like riding normal bikes, quite frankly. Uh, so I had, I was, <laughs> but I had this vision, right? And so I found a bike that can go on the beach. This bike I can ride right across the sand and get to the hard pack, and then I can ride right up the beach. It's a God thing. <laughs> it's amazing. And then I don't like pedaling them. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm learning to like it. So I needed help. So this bike, uh, see, watch. See, all I do is turn that little, little knob. And she'll go 20 miles an hour. <laughs> How many of you know where Hill Street is in Point Loma? Okay. It'll take Hill Street at four miles an hour. <laughs> now, I can pedal it. It's frankly not very efficient as a normal bicycle. But I can pedal it so I can get cardio. And I have been doing this. And it's, it's pretty amazing. So it's about vision. And it's about life. Now, this is the theme verse of our series from Surviving to Thriving. The theme verse, Jesus' words, John 10. He says, the thief has come to steal and what? Kill and destroy. But Jesus, speaking of himself, I have come that you might have what? Life. And not just life. Now, notice, uh, Jesus clarifies here. Now, a lot of times in John's gospel, particularly, he talks about life 
and doesn't expand it, if you will. I just want to make sure you understand the expansion in John 10.10 because 10, he comes to give you life, but not just life, life to its fullest, life to its completion, life to the best, if you will, to, to, to your best life. This is the will of God. This isn't just me talking, okay? This is Jesus talking. Don't get me in the way of you and him. This is what he wants for you and me. He wants your best life. Now, the BIM, this little card, uh, this is a, a hijack, if you will, from, uh, and, oh, by the way, BIM stands for Vision, Intention, and Means, which is on the back of it. If you look at the back of your card, everybody pick up your card, go like this, I want to make sure you all have one. If you don't have one, raise your hand, the servers will come and give you one. You should all have one on your chair. Okay, it stands for vision, intention, and means. And I'm going to show you from Scripture the kind of biblical basis of this idea. I just want to uh, give credit where credit is due. I got this from Dallas Willard, who I had the pleasure, while he was alive, of hearing many times in my life. He was a brilliant leader, a tremendous scholar, and he worked on soul care primarily. That was his jam. And uh, this is from Chapter 5 of this book. And I would encourage you to buy the book. Uh, you might want to take a picture of it right now. It's called Renovation of the Heart. It's uh, specifically chapter five. The whole book is about spiritual transformation. That was uh, kind of, you know, phenomenology was Dallas's specialty in philosophy, and that's all about experience. And, and so he's all about how do we experience this life of Christ? How is it that you and I, like what we studied last year in, a, in the book of Ephesians, how do we get inside of what it means to be in Christ? What, is, what does that practically look like? And so, you know, that's what, that's what we're going to do today is sort of integrate this into the story of Moses and how you live your best life, because that is what Jesus wants for you. No matter what your circumstances are, no matter what your age is, no matter what your physical predisposition is, no matter what your family situation is, whatever, it's about vision, intention, and the means, or in another way of putting it, the why, because that's the why of my bike, the why, the why I bought that bike, because that's part of my intention, actually, uh, was to then ultimately buy it, which is your mission, how, you know, what you're going to do to accomplish the vision God has for you, and then the how, how are you, how are you going to do it, okay? So the first thing is to create a vision, a vision of a better future, to, to see the dreams that God has for you. And this is always our problem, is that we have a hard time seeing what God has for us. We only see the pain of our current circumstances. And so we get fixated there. We get locked in there rather than seeing what God has in the future. Now, in this weekend, we're going to be in Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy. So it goes Genesis. The first book in the Bible is called Genesis, then Exodus, then Leviticus, then Numbers, which is where we were last weekend, and now Deuteronomy. We're going to be in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 8 for this first part. Now, you have to understand something about Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is Moses's, okay, uh, when I say the Sermon on the Mount, raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about, okay? So a lot of you do. Um, the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5, 6, and 7, which is a sermon, uh, some argue a collection of sermons, a, a sermon where G that Jesus gave on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. I've been on that hill many times. And it's quite spectacular, the Lake of Gennesaret or the Sea of Galilee is below you, it's, it's beautiful. This scene in Deuteronomy is a, is a collection of sermons, much like Matthew 5 through 7, given by Moses to the people of God who have experienced the exodus out of Egypt. They've been you know, taken from slavery, and now they've spent 40 years, as you learned last weekend, they spent 40 years wandering around in the desert, <laughs> which was not God's best for them, but he managed it. That's what he does with you, right? How many of you know you disobey on you know, all kinds of experiences and days and stuff like that, right? So, so he does the same thing in our lives. He accommodates. He works with you. How many of you are thankful that he does it that way, right? Like, I'm super glad he has mercy and grace. So he's like them. Now Moses, so he's been leading them for 40 years. By the way, Moses, what, does anyone in the room know how old Moses was when he started leading the people of God? 80. 80. How many of you are under 80? That's when he started okay, when he was, he, and he was a train smash, okay, like when he was 40, he commits murder, 
okay? So he had this amazing life. So here we are. Now, there are, we're on the eastern side of the Jordan River, the Jordan River Valley, that is a, about to have a miracle by which the Israelites will cross over. But it, we're on the east side of it, just north of the Dead Sea. Moses is delivering this series of messages and revelations from God. So look at chapter 8. I'm going to actually start at verse uh, 6, by the way. So we're kind of catching him mid-sermon. Ready? So, they, uh, so obey the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. Now, when the Bible says fear God, it means have an awe, have a respect. Kind of like that book on marriage, Love and Respect. How many of you have ever read the book Love and Respect? Egrich, Egrich's book on marriage, a tremendous read. If you're thinking life group leaders, you're thinking of a book that you still haven't kind of been you know, fixed on it, and you're married, and you have a married group, or if you have like engaged people or seriously dating people, that would be incredible. I wish I would have read a book like that uh, before I got married. Uh, anyway, uh, so respect is that word. Uh, verse 7, for the Lord your God is bringing you into a land, now he's talking to the Israelites about the promised land. He's talking to you and I about health, about your marriage about your kids, about the, maybe the relationship them, maybe the relationship with a troubled child that you want to address this year. Uh, maybe, maybe you have an adult child. How many of you have adult children? Okay, like a bunch of you. So you know, they're, how many of you know they're complicated? <laughs> you know, we think they're complicated in the teenage years, right? <laughs> and then they grow up. <laughs> Any, anyway, so maybe it's one of them that, you know, is particularly having a challenge or whatever. Whatever. Could be a parent. You're, you're now 40 and your parents are older and, and you're dealing with them and, and whatever. Okay, so that's the land. That's the land. A land with brooks, streams. Look at how Moses is speaking. With brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and the hills. A land of wheat and barley, vines and fig trees. Notice the detail. Pomegranates, how many of you like pomegranates? Yeah. Olive oil, how many of you like olive oil? Right? Huge. Uh, and honey, God likes honey. I'm just saying, God's into honey. And by the way, if you want to get some really good honey, you go to the OB Street Fair every Wednesday night. There's a dude there who has like 15 kinds of honey. I was there Wednesday night. I bought this honey that is like the best honey. It's making my mouth water right this second. <laughs> I, I, if you have an English muffin in the morning and you put a little bit of almond butter, which they also sell there, and then you put a little bit of that honey on there, I'm just telling you, it was like so good. God loves honey. So do I. A land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing. This is what God wants for all of us. A land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. This is the will of God for us. We, we have to get inside of God's vision for us. And God's promises lead toward an optimism. Christ followers should be the most optimistic people on the planet. We should, we should be like, uh, you know, uh, basically cup half full kind of people. We, we should be people who see the future. God, that's what God wants for you. That's why I'm teaching you this, this tool, okay? And this is, this is what God's trying to teach the Israelites. The Israelites tend to see only the step right in front of them. They tend to walk through life with their eyes down. God's trying to get them to get their eyes up. Moses is on the east side of the Jordan River Valley. You can see across from Mount Nebo. You can see the promised land over there. He's trying to get them to see. Now, when, when, he, when he says this, the Lord your God is bringing you into a bad land. No, it's a good land, okay? But God, do you know what my marriage is like? Uh, God would say, uh, yes, I do. <laughs> How about that becomes your vim for 2019? I'm just saying for the Lord your God. Now, you have to understand what you're doing t today, what you're doing in life is a collaboration with grace. Okay, there's God's grace and then there's you walking in obedience. There's you getting your eyes off of the ground onto the horizon. There's you kind of seeing the ways of God on the earth. It's you seeing the kingdom of God come to earth the way Jesus taught you. In the Lord's Prayer, what did he teach you? What did he teach me? How many of you memorized it as a kid? The, you know, the, our Father? 
None of you guys over here in this section memorize the Our Father? Wow. All I have to do a sermon series on the Our Father. In that prayer, just for you, uh, in that prayer, it, Jesus taught you to pray. It teaches us to pray. It's in the Bible, okay? He says, when the guys come to him and they say, hey, Jesus, teach us to pray. And so Jesus teaches them a basic prayer that's kind of, you know, a, a skeleton, if you will, uh, upon all prayer is built uh, or laid. Anyway, he says, pray like this. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. What's the prayer about? The prayer is about keeping my eyes on heaven and my earth, my earth, where I am. That's why our vision as a church, this is our vision as a church. This is what we do. Everything aligns around this. We develop leaders who change their world. That is what I do with you every weekend, or Pastor Danny, or Marcus, or whoever's up here. Yeah, that's the whole worship experience. That's all of our ministry streams. That's team night tonight, is to develop you so that you can change your world. Now, in relationship to the church, it's the stream of ministry that you're in, but you have to see the vision. It's not just you, you, you know, what you're doing in a children's ministry capacity if you work in kids, you're, you're actually developing them so that when they grow up, they just clobber it. They kill it. They crush it for the kingdom of God. That's what you're doing. Parents, that's what you're doing. You're raising up the leaders of the future who are going to change their world. That, and this has to be a part of your vision. And by the way, this part of what we're doing today is very uh, applicable, if I could put it, to your vim, to your vision, because this is your, this has to be a part of your vision. Why do I say that? Because Jesus said it. Really? Show me. Okay. <laughs> See how I did that? It's like, phew. So Jesus, this is the very end of the Matthew, uh, of Gospel of Matthew. Very last thing Jesus says in the Gospel. He says, now all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Because, you know, he's post-resurrection. This is actually one of the post-resurrection appearances. And he says, he says, so now, this is what I want you guys to do. So these are your marching orders, okay? This is what you're supposed to do in your life. You get to decide. He says, now I want you to go and make what? Disciples. It's another word for leader. I want you to go and make leaders. By the way, this is when the gospel... Uh, crosses over the ethnic boundary and barrier of Judaism and uh, Hebrew uh, uh, ideology, if you will, and, and crosses over the barrier and becomes truly now multi-ethnic. In fact, the Greek word for nations in this passage is eth ethne, ethnos, basically, which we get ethnic from. Uh, anyways, all nations, so it, it cro now it goes global, which is what we do. Like, why are we involved in Liberia, for crying out loud? Well, because... It's the will of God. What do you think? I just thought of that stuff. It's the will of God. We're supposed to be involved globally, which we are, obviously. We have 80 missionaries plus. We um, give them straight out about 300 grand or 320 grand a year. I forget how much it is, but that's our kingdom builder stuff. Anyway, go into all the nations, discipling them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then what? What's he say right here? What's he say? What are you supposed to do? Teach them everything. To obey everything that there is in the whole Bible, in the whole universe, in the whole world. No. What's he say? Teach him what I've taught you. So if you're just starting in your relationship with Jesus, God's shown you some stuff. That's it. That's what you're a steward of now. Now you're responsible when you develop leaders, which you all do, then, I mean, whether you know it or not, you, if leadership is influence... You are, by definition, influencing, thus developing leaders. You're either developing lousy ones or good ones. My goal for you is that you get to develop more and more better leaders, okay? That's my goal. All the parenting seminars we do, everything we do, is all to develop you so that you'll develop better leaders. That's the deal. That's what we do. So, you know, from a biblical perspective, what Jesus is saying, I want you to teach them everything that I teach you. So every time you learn something, you are now responsible for that. Vim, vim, this tool. <laughs> now... It becomes yours. Dallas created, Dallas Willard created it. I'm teaching it to you. Now you have it. The question is, what are you going to do with it? We'll pray about it at the end. 
And this is true with, this is your ministry description, if you will, your job description. This is your jam. This is what you're doing everywhere you are, in your home, in your street, in your workplace, where you play on the beach, my God's country, uh, you know, wherever you are, that's what you do. Then you have to live intentionally. You have to resolve to change with intentionality. If you're taking notes, write this down. I have to decide to align. I have to decide to align behind my vision. Uh, in my case, I, one of my vision points of 2019 is to just get in better health in general, right? So now I have to align my, my intentionality around my vision. Like, okay, that's cool. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, I want to be healthier at the end of 2019 than I am going in. Awesome. That's a tremendous vision. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> That's the what, okay? That's the what. Now, we're going to leap to the end of the Deuteronomic uh, experience, right? And Deuteronomy, by the way, means second statement of the law, which comes to us in the book of Leviticus. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, that's where the law specifically is. Deuteronomy is, is a kind of narrative form of the law. So at the end, and, and remember, uh, Moses is 120 in this scene. In Deuteronomy, he's 120. He's going to die. So he's going to pass the baton to whom? Who's he, who's he been discipling? Aaron, but yes, but specifically he's going to pass the baton to Joshua. Remember the story of the spies from last weekend? Remember Joshua and Caleb are the only two spies that are going to go into the promised land because the other, uh, what, ten of them came back and, and spread, uh, you know, doubt and fear. That was last weekend, okay? So he's giving this sermon. He says, this day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death. And this is before you. This is set before you. How many of you want life, not death? Raise your hand. Decide. You get to decide. You get to decide. This is a daily decision. You know, Jesus said, using cross as a metaphor of dying to self, he said, guys, I want you to take up your cross monthly and follow me. No, he didn't. He didn't say that. I'm totally lying right now. He said, take, oh, you guys, he said, he, he's like, really? I know, some of you are new. This is just how I am. Okay, look, he said, he didn't say that. He said, take up your cross, what? Daily and follow him. So uh, deciding to align is a daily thing, a daily thing. Uh, anyway, so he says, now choose life so that you're, what? Your children may live this intentionality. You have to see it as multi-generational. And if you don't have kids or cannot have kids or will not have kids or whatever, you know, it's not in God's plan for you to have kids, you do have them. They're all the younger ones than you that you are developing in life to be leaders who change their world. Now, intentionality is an act of the will. It is a resolute decision. So intentionality, like my mission, like what am I going to do? I have a vision for greater health in 2019. What am I going to do? So I had to decide, oh, well, I think I need to get a bike. Now, I don't like bike riding. You know, I just, I just don't. Uh, I don't like cardio, as I said earlier. I, I just don't like it. So I had to resolve that. So I had to decide. I had to kind of land on a bike that would work for me, that would allow me to cheat, that it would allow me to develop cardio to my liking, uh, that would, I could pedal it as much as I want. I, I figured if I did it, I'd like it and I'd love it and I, it'd give me energy in life, and it has and it does. So I, but I had, to, I had to find a bike guy. Uh, so I found this guy, Velofix. Dude drove by my house. You know, I had made a decision, electric was the deal, but there are a thousand kind of these things. I wanted one that would go on the beach. I wanted one that would fold. This will fold in half. These handlebars fold down. It breaks right here and folds in half. I can put it in my car. I wanted a bike I could take anywhere, but that I could still cheat with, right? You know, because I don't like to ride. Okay, so, so all this had to be a part. This is, all the, this is all the what. This is all mission. This is all decisions. Act of the will. So I met this Velofix guy. He drove by my house in one of those Sprinter vans. Had bikes all over it. It was a word of God. <laughs> so I was with Teresa in my car, and we were about to drive down into town, and so I, made, I said, honey, we got to chase this guy down. So we made a Yui, and I stuck on this guy's bumper. He only lived like three blocks from me. When he pulled up to his house, he thought I was going to stalk him or something. I don't know what Brett thought, but I met Brett this way. 
and, and he has this franchise thing called Velofix, and, and that, you know, so Brett knows how to do this. And I, c I don't know how to work on bicycles, especially electric ones. So I needed, how am I going to fix them when they break? So it's complicated, right? So Brett can do everything. It's like, he's like an angel. <laughs> See, look, you and I, we do not drift into the best life. Very rarely. Once in a while, there are times in your life you might drift into God's vision for your life. Once in a while. But generally, you have to choose it. You have to be very, very intentional in life. Uh, this could be, by the way, a lid. This is perhaps, if you're not getting promoted at work, um, I would suggest that Vim is a huge key to your promotion that God has for you. He wants to bless you, but you have to choose. You have to be intentional. You got to be like on a mission. You know, you, you got to be in it to win it. This is the deal. This is the deal. So, so this, this question, like what intentional decisions am I making this year to choose life? Like what is it that I'm doing? Because Jesus wants this for you. So I don't know what it is for you. Now on a spiritual side, you know, maybe going to the next steps class, which is in the next service, or if that doesn't fit in your planning, you go to it because it's every like every two weeks or something like that. If you just pay attention or go online at newbreak.info, it'll tell you everything. And maybe, maybe getting in a life group, which they have these brochures this week, which, you know, we're starting that process where we all get back in our life groups. Or if you're not in one, again, like Danny was talking about, Discover Your Pathway is a tremendous one. If you're having trouble uh, managing your finances and how God's integrated into that, you can go to the FP Youth uh, groups or the finance seminar, obviously, whatever. Now, this is about your mission statement. This is about, you know, what you're going to do. I had to buy a bike, okay? What, what are you going to do to fulfill your vision, okay? So, like, as a church, we have this mission statement. You guys know this. This is, this is the what we do. How do we develop leaders? Well, see, I know that if I can connect a leader with God, and then I can do it authentically and get him or her involved in authentic relationships. And, and, and then, and not, this doesn't have to be sequential. This can be inverted. Like, for example, I know, because I've done it many times, where I get a neighbor to go help me serve Tierra Santa or at Hope Center serve, you know, with the, I don't know, forget how many meals, what do we serve out there? A hundred and something thousand meals and 2018, you know, whatever. I know that if I can get somebody serving, because it's written into the code of man and woman by God to serve their community, they don't necessarily know how to do that or, or whatever, but it, they have it in them. So if I can get them serving, it kind of helps invertedly. Like if I can get them serving, then they'll start to meet you. <laughs> and then if they meet you, I am assuming you're going to be nice to them. If you're not, I will talk with you. <laughs> anyway, so then they meet you, and then through this experience, they start to connect to God. They start to think, huh, th this is not exactly what I expected. So, and, it, and it happens like kind of serendipitously, if you will. Like, uh, like in my life, I didn't, there's, a, there's a something that happened with this bike that I did not anticipate. Uh, it has a, it has a I mean, to me, it's cool. I just didn't know how that would, I didn't even really think about how that would play out. So I'm at the taco stand right underneath Ace Tattoo Parlor in OB. How many of you know where Ace Tattoos is? It's one of the great tattoo places in the county. <laughs> it's impressive that you don't know this. Google it. Anyway, uh, underneath it are the, some of the best carne asada tacos on the world, in the world. Thus, you should Google it. I don't remember the name. Somebody told me last night it's called Mike's Taco Shop. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. But whatever. I was in there eating a taco. Carne asada. The fish tacos are okay. Uh, South Beach, way better. Anyway. Uh, so I'm in there. And I, I'm sitting just a few feet from my bike. Because I didn't have my lock yet. And, you know, you got to watch it. And so anyway, I'm eating. Everybody that walks by my bike stops and looks at my bike. It's freaky. It's like weird. Everybody. Men, women, kids, everybody. So anyway, these two guys and, a, and one of their wives, I forget which one the, the wife was, but they were watching my bike and, and then they came, they were standing there for two minutes, probably three minutes, and then they walked in to the restaurant. I'm sitting outside, you know, under the umbrella right there, and they walk by me and I go, hey, do you like my bike? And he goes, dude, is that your bike? And I go, yes, my bike, it's super cool, I just got it. He goes, that thing's sick, blah, 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 blah. And so he goes in, he gets his taco, and he sits down right next to me. And I go, 
I go, yeah. And so we get talking about my bike. It's called a Rad bike, R-A-D. This is a Rad Mini. And uh, anyway, so he gets talking about my bike. So, you know, one thing leads to the another. You know, again, I live in a world where I'm constantly trying to connect people with God through authentic relationships with different communities, right? So, his name's Thad. So today, he has bought a Rad Mini, and he now goes to our OB campus. He doesn't know who I am. I just told him, I go to church. It's really a cool church. You might check it out. He's like, I've eh, been thinking about maybe going to church. And anyway, now he goes to the OB campus. He texts me pictures. He has no idea. Anyway, it's so funny. <laughs> it's just funny. Now, look, when it comes to intentionality, Willard says it this way. We must intend the vision if it is to be realized. That is, we must initiate. We must initiate. Bring into being those factors that would bring the vision into reality. Now, this is a very spiritual thing. This is what Moses is trying to do to the Israelites in this account. And then thirdly, we have to develop the means to change. You have to develop the means to, to, to change. The strategy must come to bear. I must ride the bike. I must start to pedal the bike. I must do it with consistency. And it's amazing, like in two months or whatever, three, three months now, my legs are stronger, I work out differently in the gym, and I can actually pedal pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty good. It's, it's like a miracle. It's like a miracle. Now, look at it. Look in Deuteronomy. We're going to go to uh, chapter 6. This is often referred to as the Shema, because that is the Hebrew word. Everybody say Shema. Very good. I'm teaching you a little Hebrew. Uh, that is the word we translate in this text for hear. The word could be translated hear or obey. By the way, in Hebrew culture, in the ancient world, because we're in 1400 B.C., by the way, in Deuteronomy. So in Deuteronomy, we're in 1400 B.C., a, a name, kind of like a nickname, that they would give to a small child was Shema. So it's kind of cute, right? So my now 39-year-old, so when he was little, I would have called him Shema if I were uh, an Israelite. And, and that word means hear or obey, right? Isn't that cute? Like, hey, Michael, Shema. <laughs> anyway, I think it's funny. Uh, Shema, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Then these words you may be familiar with in the New Testament because of Jesus, if you've ever heard these words. Love the Lord your God with all your what? Heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Now, Jesus adds the word mind in some of the gospel accounts. Anyway, everything you are. Uh, and then, notice, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. So, you now, strategy, the whole them is a heart thing, okay? It's a heart thing. It's a God thing, okay? So, it's to be on your hearts. Uh, and then he uses this really cool word. It's translated impress in your NIV. That's the version we use generally in here. Uh, the word could be translated repeat, uh, and ultimately it has the connotation of engrave. So through repetitious talking, teaching, you're engraving the values on another leader. Okay? You get it? Like, like as in your workplace, uh, you are not able to, let's say, openly be about Jesus for whatever, how, you know, how to frame that, right? But you can teach the values of the kingdom of God. And eventually, they'll ask the why, 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 why are you so different? Like, why, is you, why are you not just about getting ahead? Why is it that you're not about manipulation in my workspace? Like, like what, what makes you see, eventually you're going to teach them the values of the kingdom? And then they'll start to ask you questions. Thad, Thad, who goes to the OB campus. It's the same difference. So impress them on your who? Children. Now, again, blow it up to leader, but blow it down to children or grandchildren if you have grandchildren. Talk about them all the time. When you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up, uh, tie them as symbols on your hands, which they ultimately physically do. Literally, I'm not sure that was... Uh, necessarily the will of God, but whatever. They do all kinds of stuff in church, in church history for that matter. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Uh, that's about vision, by the way. For, that's a metaphoric for vision. Tie them on your foreheads. You can see. Israelites see 
new breakers. C, write them on the door frames of your houses. In other words, let them be a value of your home life and on your gates. This is why we love our fire department. Because we are, we're aligning with these wonderful entities, with these men and women in it who lay their lives down for you and I. This is why we do what we do at the schools. This is why we do what we do everywhere. It's about helping people shift gears. And when it comes to the means or, or the strategy, you commit to doing your part and trust God to do his part. You have to trust him to do his part. Now, means is cultivating the strategy to live your best life. I must ride. I have to ride. I have to ride regularly. Now what I do is I ride to my gym. I park my bike at my gym. Every time I have parked my bike at my gym, every time, I'm not exaggerating, every single time, in fact, I have to almost budget it in my time. Every time I go to the gym with my bike, every single time somebody says, hey, is that your bike? And then all of a sudden I'm having these God conversations. And this is a biblical thing, you guys. G Paul in Philippians, he says, I can do all this through who? Him. Who's the him? Christ. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. I must ride. Now, our strategy in Newbreak, and you hear this all the time, but our strategy is the three B's, right? To begin the week, let's read it out loud. To begin the week in worship, to belong together in life groups, and to be the church by serving. So this is our fundamental strategy because I know if I can get Thad, if I can get him to go to the worship experience and get, become a worshiper and become a person who regularly, consistently hears the word of God spoken to him and is prayed for, if I can get Thad there, then I can get him into a life group and I can get him into a group of people where he'll build his warriors and his warriors will align with him and help him and care for him and then he'll be the church through serving. You see, that's what the Vim is all about. That's what the Vim is all about. It's all about you and I aligning. Everybody take your Vim out. Now, this is about your best life. So I'm going to ask you to choose right now. Do you want God's best life for your life? You got your Vim in your hand? If you do, stand. If you don't, don't. Now, God really spoke this into me this week. I know there's an inordinate amount of pressure on you to stand, so go ahead and stand, whatever. <laughs> But I really want to challenge you to do this vim. If you are estranged from a parent or a child or a brother, for that matter, use the vim there. I don't want to, you need to have God speak the vim into you. In fact, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. God, I pray right now, you will give us our vision piece. Be specific with us, Lord. Help us. We get so scattered all around. Help us to see the land that you have for us in 2019. Not just as a church, but us as individuals, like as people, like standing here in this space. Of course, give it to us as a church. You constantly do that. But, but uh, give it to us as people, like a person. Lord, for those of us who our lives are not right with you, your life's not right with God, raise your hands. Your, life, your life's not right with him, and you just need to pray about that. Raise your hands up. That's me, Pastor Mike. I need to pray about that. So, yeah, lots of people across the room. So you can put your hands down. Let's pray. Let's pray. In fact, let's pray together. Ready? Father, I love you. I know you love me. You love me more than I can even understand. You have a dream for me, a vision for me. You have a mission for me, and you have a strategy for me. Make it clear to me, please. I can be thick as a brick. Help me have your mercy in my life, your forgiveness in my life, your love in my life. I lay it down for you. Help me to live the best life with Jesus Christ at the center. In Jesus' name, thank you. Amen.